as you heard yesterday, founded primarily on the argument that the 2009 MOU constitutes an agreement to have recourse to some other method of dispute settlement within the meaning of Kenya's reservation to its Article 36.2 declaration. Somalia disagrees. In our view, the one and the only purpose of the MOU was to assure that there would be no obstacle to the CLCS consideration of our two countries' submissions concerning the establishment of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. The very title of this document confirms this. The MOU is entitled Memorandum of Understanding between the Government of the Republic of Kenya and the Transitional Federal Government of the Somali Republic to grant each other no objection in respect of submissions on the outer limits of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. There is no indication that the MOU was intended or indeed, in fact, established an agreed method of dispute settlement that could bar this court's jurisdiction. As our very able counsel will show in the course of this morning, at no time, whether before or after the signing of the MOU, did Somalia or Kenya understand the MOU to have the effect Kenya now seeks to ascribe to it. As I said, we did negotiate and negotiate hard. The record shows that we engaged in a substantive and detailed exchange of views. Kenya never once expressed the view that negotiations were provisional only, and that any agreement, should there be one, would have to wait until after the CLCS has issued its recommendations. That would have been illogical and contrary to Kenya's express wish to reach an amicable solution promptly. Mr. President, members of the court, in Somalia's view, Kenya cannot truly believe that the MOU created a binding commitment to an alternative method of dispute settlement. Rather, it appears that Kenya is looking for a way to avoid the court's exercise of jurisdiction and thus avoid a binding judgment upon the parties. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that Kenya lacks confidence in the merits of its case. The court has never delimited a boundary on the basis of Kenya's approach. And the applicable international law, the 1982 Convention, does not direct it. Nor do the decisions of other international courts or arbitral tribunals offer support to Kenya's unlikely arguments. Perhaps that's why Kenya has now fallen back to an even more unlikely argument that UNCLOS itself constitutes an agreement to an alternative method of dispute settlement within the meaning of its reservation to its Article 36.2 declaration. This argument, which took up all of one sentence in Kenya's written pleading, has now assumed a much greater prominence. As Professor Sands will show, it can be rejected just as easily. Kenya is represented by able and experienced counsel. It knows that it does not have a serious case on, it, on the merit. But if they can force us back into negotiations without hope of judicial recourse, they can refuse to agree unless we give them a large portion of our EEZ and continental shelf something no self-respecting Somali government could ever do. Kenya can use its greater political and economic power to prevent us from accessing the resources to which international law entitles us. Moreover, continued uncertainty over the course of our maritime boundary does not benefit anyone. The dispute will remain an unwelcome tension, source of tension between our two countries at a time when what is needed is more increased cooperation. If we are to have any hope of a durable and equitable solution that contributes to regional peace and security, it lies here in this great hall of justice and in the hands of the distinguished members of this court. Mr. Berg, President, members of the court, with that I come to the organization of our first round presentations.